Well, good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Joe Bojo. I'm the director of the space you're in right now, the Capgemini Applied Innovation Exchange. So just uh, by show of hands, uh, in, in my curiosity, for how many of you tonight is this your first time at a What's Now San Francisco event? All right, I see a lot of familiar faces, and about half of you, you're, it's your first time here. So for those of you that are new, welcome. Uh, you picked a good night to come. Uh, just a, a couple words about what is the Applied Innovation Exchange and the concept, what do we do here? Um, so if you, if you think of the name and you break it down a little bit, Applied Innovation Exchange. So Exchange, a lot of the clients that we have are big, large corporate companies from around the world. And when they come to Silicon Valley or they, as a company, are struggling with what do these new technologies and concepts and transformations really mean to them, it's best to have an exchange, a dialogue, an interaction. So we facilitate things like this to a degree, but on a smaller basis with our clients and exchange with the emerging technology landscape that is available to us here in Silicon Valley. Uh, and then the outcome of that is, well, what do you go do with it? Well, you have to apply the learning and you have to apply the innovations to get real outcomes. So we'll co-locate with our clients, live with them for a while here to make sure that they're, they're on the right path. So happy to talk to you more about that through the evening tonight. With that, I'll hand it over to our partner for this series, uh, Pete uh, Layden from reInvent, to uh, take us through the rest of the evening. Thank you, Joe. Good to put it out there. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Cap Gemini, for really underwriting and partnering with us in this series here and having this fantastic space here. I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of reInvent. Our team here is a media company. The folks around here you're seeing here, and we kind of produce and kind of host this. And one of the things that's been great, as he pointed out, is there's been a lot of people who have consistently been here, some of them from the beginning. I've seen some faces. There's a guy here, there's many, probably almost all of them, and a few others like that. And we've seen some kind of early adopters have come more than one time, and we got folks just, let's say, the, uh, the early majority here of you coming in now after we're about a year and a half into this. Uh, the reason this is interesting is you are all our pioneers, and in fact, you've been, this has been so successful that we're going to be expanding now to New York. And so in the fall, we're basically going to be doing a What's Now New York. It will we'll try, it probably will not rival What's Now San Francisco, just to be sure. But uh, anyhow, we are doing that. Now, what I'm going to ask you is this, because the whole idea about this is this is an invite-only crowd. This has grown, this network has grown by invite-onlys, and you bringing in folks that you think are interesting. And so we're going to be sending out an email next week, everyone on this list, which is on the, the grand list of the whole thing. And we're going to ask you if you have anyone in New York you think is really the kind of person that would really enjoy this, someone who's an innovator, someone who really is doing some interesting stuff, who would want to be a part of a monthly series out there in New York. And we'll be, we'll be sending out. You'll all get it next week. Love to do that. Also, key networkers, people who are in different, ne diverse networks in New York who would want to really tie into this as we replicate the same kind of series uh, in New York. So, but today we're not going to be worrying about New York right now, but what we are going to be thinking about is AI and robotics. And honestly, that issue is just exploding right now out in the, the sphere out there. In fact, just this week, the last couple of days, you know, you had Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg kind of having it out in a high profile argument around the future of AI in which, you know, Elon really was talking about that AI is the greatest risk our civilization faces. And Zuckerberg was countering like, well, it seems overblown. It's not really helpful to come be talking like that. And then Elon came back and said, well, you don't know what you're talking about. And he doesn't really understand AI. <laughs> uh, but also our culture, I mean, movies are now just, you know, with her to ex machina. We got TV, like Westworld, this preoccupation with robots, AI, and where it's going. But also in the just the current media, it's like the people really worried about job displacement. The Economist had a huge, you know, art, a big series and, and big article was talking about half of the jobs in America would be under threat, at least from possible disruption in the next 20 years uh, to automation, advanced automation. Now, what we've decided, well, so we wanted to wait in this, week, this month as we do kind of systematically go through different areas of innovation. This month, really focus on robotics and AI. And we want someone to really talk to us about the real state of the art, what's really going on, as we always do in these things. What is the latest thing? What's the latest thinking in this space? But also, uh, we wanted to get someone who could talk about this larger question, the big picture of uh, this great debate that's playing out in front of us here. And to do that, we basically uh, found and know of and finally got Ken Goldberg to actually come and talk to us. Now, Ken is the perfect person to lead us through this conversation. He is a bona fide expert in robotics, no question about it. I mean, he basically is the, I guess, 
just recently got the William Floyd Distinguished Chair of Engineering in Berkeley. Uh, he runs an advanced robotics lab with all these grad students and trying the front edge of robotics uh, over in the UC Berkeley. But, and he's, you know, had eight patents. He's had 250 papers in the space. He definitely gets the space. But the beauty of Ken is he's a great communicator, too. He really knows how to explain this to people. He's basically had 400 talks all over the world in these kind of on these kind of issues. Uh, and he's an artist and a filmmaker, even. And in fact, he's done some work with his wife, who's here today, too, Tiffany Schlain, the innovative filmmaker of the Bay Area here. Uh, and so he can really explain this in a, in a really powerful way. So what we're going to have him do is he's been grappling with this issue in his latest thinking, which just came out, a little surface of it in a Wall Street Journal article recently, just within the month here. He's giving you fresh ideas, fresh perspective on this whole debate. He's going to talk about that. Then we're going to have a little conversation, he and I, just to kind of roll it to you. But as always, the people in the crowd, we have an awesome crowd here. A lot of people know this space, a lot of people know other spaces. And we're going to have a really great, robust conversation here, all on video, out to the world. And afterwards, we're going to continue the conversation, as he mentioned, over drinks and dinner and schmoozing around with music uh, in the space. So with that, let's bring up Ken. Thank you, Pete. That is a great intro. I really appreciate it. And uh, I do, uh, I, I have to say, I'm super excited to be here. These are some of my favorite people in the audience. And um, as you know, as you just said, the, the AI and robots are all the rage right now. And we're, we're seeing, the, seeing it in the movies. We're seeing it on television. It's in the newspapers. There's a lot of concerns. And we also see major results happening. There's some ma there are some, some innovations in, in, the, in the field that are, that are surprising even the experts. And a lot of this um, sort of circulates around the, world, the word singularity. And uh, how many of you know this word? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, everyone knows. It's, it's a hypothetical point in time when robots surpass humans. So uh, it's, it's just a word that, fo it's a focal point for a lot of these ideas. And the question we're all trying to <laughs> figure out <laughs> is, <laughs> is, uh, is AI and robotics a threat or an opportunity? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So what we want to, I want to explore this in three parts. So we'll start with, with what isn't new. Then we'll talk about what is new, and that's the title of the series. So we'll focus, we'll spend most of the time on that. And then we'll talk about how we might prepare for this future. So we all agree that we live in a time where technology is accelerating faster than ever before. And if we just want to compare, for example, um, the, the period we're in to 100 years ago, the, the, the first uh, tw two decades of the 20th century. Well, um, you know, what did, they, what, did, what did they have then? I mean, it was pretty primitive, right? I mean, well, they did invent the automobile <laughs> during that period. And, um, it was a time when they invented the airplane. Uh, also, um, air conditioning. And, um, uh, oh yeah, Einstein invent discovered the theory of relativity. Um, and then if you want to know a really important breakthrough that all we're all benefiting from tonight, the zipper. <laughs> and what have, what have we done in the last 20 years? Well, we've got fracking, drones, and Twitter. Now, to be fair, actually, uh, we have done some things, and we've discovered the Higgs boson, we have the Hyperloop on the way, and CRISPR is revolutionizing genetics. So we have made progress, but my point is that technology has been changing, has always been changing, and always been evol evolving. And many jobs, when, when technology's changed, many jobs are lost. So we don't see a lot of ice men anymore, or um, elevator operators. And, uh, or switchboard operators, but, um, and as where it really affected m Americans and, and people around the world was on farms. It completely changed the idea of farm labor. So technology has had big changes, but what also happened during this history, over the last hundred years, is that new jobs were created. So when the automobile emerged, we got, suddenly we needed roads and infrastructure, so there were massive amounts of jobs that had to be built to create that. And we, had to we needed new sources of energy. 
So the whole petroleum industry, all the refining and the mining and all those things, the transportation had to be developed around those. So there was a huge influx of new jobs that, 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 that came at the same time as jobs were lost. All right, so that's, that's what I want to say about what isn't new. Now I'll shift into what I think is new. And I want to acknowledge that I, I'm very fortunate to be at Berkeley and have a great group of students to work with. I have about 30 students, about half undergrads and half grads and postdocs in my group, and I also collaborate with tremendous colleagues. What we're, we've been doing recently is we have a lab, and I've been gr working on a, a new center initiative called the People and Robots Initiative. And it's particularly around the idea that I believe there's some interesting synergies to get be gained by thinking about robots and people together. Now, let's look at the scenario of um, the recent results with, with AlphaGo and the, uh, the results uh, beating the world champions in Go. This is uh, actually the, 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 the big news was about a month ago. And one thing to keep in mind, this, is, this is sounds scary. You know, you have the smartest person in the world, the best Go player in the world is being vanquished by a robot. And um, so a lot of people are worried, does this, you know, what does this mean? Well, the thing to keep in mind is if you look at a game like this, it's a, it's a board, and it, the, the key point of it is that we have, we, it's a binary perfect information environment. It's a, it's a perfect information game. Now, it's true that to play such a game, you have to be able to search possibilities. And there's a vast number of possibilities. It's exponential. So you make a move, what is he going to do, and, and he or she going to do, and what's the next move, et cetera. So we've learned how to search this space very, very effectively, and it's very impressive. I don't want to take away from it. This is a breakthrough for sure. But I also want to say this is not the real world. So the world that we want to be able to have these robots, and we're thinking about them, is the world that we all live in. We got here tonight, and we had to navigate streets, and we might want robots in our homes, or we want them in factories or in operating rooms. And this is very different. So I want to make the point, the first point tonight, that, that the, the world of games is very different than the world of reality. And in the game, the world is binary or discrete and fully observed. We know everything about it. We can, we can characterize it. But in the real world, it's completely different. We, it's continuous and higher dimensional and, um, and very, very uncertain. That's a fundamental difference to please keep in mind. Now, um, the wave in artificial intelligence has really been fueled by three things. First, massive data sets. And this is really thanks to all of you because we've been putting in our data. And at alarming rates, um, and ever since the uh, World Wide Web in the early days that uh, when I first met Pete and uh, with through Tiffany. Um, so the web has been expanding and this is continuing uh, dramatically. The second is advances in computing. In addition to Moore's Law, we also have things like the graphical processing units and cloud computing that are now advancing what we can do with computing. And the third is, the is grows actually from these first two, which is known as deep learning. And this is a set of algorithms that make use of vast data sets to train, basically to tune, a very, very large parameter, a, a function approximator. And I'll say more about what that is. But don't, when you hear neural network, it sounds like it, that we've figured out how, to, how the brain works. No, we have not. In fact, a, a neuroscientist recently said, if, the, if understanding the brain is like walking a mile, well, so far we've come three inches. Okay, we have no idea how the brain works. So don't be, I want to be very careful about that analogy. But we have learned some th interesting things. And these tools, these, ma these algorithms, are actually showing some very promising results. Also, the other thing that's happening is the advances in networking. So we now have 5G. And uh, I should say, we will soon have 5G. We have a roadmap how to get there. It's not easy. And it's going to take probably at least five to 10 years. But it's a matter of putting in new infrastructure, new transmitters, et cetera. But we're going to dramatically increase the, the, the bandwidth, the amount of information that we can transmit to all of our devices. I've been thinking about these things for a while, especially in the context of what networks and the cloud mean for robots. So early, long time ago, 20 years ago, we built a, the first robot on the internet. Um, thank you. We set it up as, a, as an art installation, actually, and it was a, called the Telegarden. We had 100,000 people coming into a garden uh, remotely. And the, the Google's, the, the thing to keep in mind about Google's uh, project is that they're also making use of the network. The Google Car relies on the network for its operation for the cloud. 
So this new idea, which I'm very excited about, is what we might call cloud robotics. And it's the idea that almost everywhere a robot, you might have a robot, it has access to the network, to the cloud. And so you can make use of that, whether it's a car or a drone or a, a, a home robot, a surgical robot, a factory robot, they're all connected to these data centers. And that vastly, that has huge potential to expand the capabilities. For example, imagine we want a robot to clean up our homes. Okay, now, um, my office doesn't look that different from this. I, I, my, my, my daughter's here, she'll, she'll testify. The, um, the, what we, would be great is if we could go to work and come home and everything would be put away. And uh, this is complicated because any robot is going to carry a certain amount of information on board, and then it's going to come up with things that it hasn't seen before, it doesn't know what to do with. Edge cases, corner cases. This is inevitable. So any, any finite robot is only so much memory, there's only so many objects it's going to be able to, be to, 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 to have experience with. But the good news is, if you have access to the cloud, well, you have access to almost every information about everything out there. So everything you can encounter, there's somewhere there's a website that has information about it. And it's got information like the center of mass, the CAD model, the frictional properties, and how it works, and where it's supposed to go in your home. So this is the first advantage of cloud robotics, which is that access to big data. Again, on demand, not, not carrying it on board, but our robots can now go online, get access to images, maps, models, and code. And the code is really an important part of this because they can, you don't have to have all the software pre-programmed and pre-loaded. The other issue is, consider the problem of, of, uh, of cleaning up after a dinner party. All right, it's something we'd all like a robot to do, but um, I want you now to put yourself in the position of being a robot. So this is what your world looks like. Your sensors are noisy and imprecise. Your motors and your actuators are also noisy and imprecise. So you combine both of those things, and it's not surprising that robots are incredibly clumsy. So the central problem, and I'll come back to this again and again, is uncertainty that we just don't know everything about our environment. So we have uncertainty in, in, in perception and control and even actually in physics. And we could talk about this later and, and I, 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 I hope we have, you'll write down questions and we, and I, I, by the way, I love to be, um, unlike our current president, I, I love to be contradicted. <laughs> so um, if you have questions and, uh, and, and you wanna challenge me on any one of these points, please do. I'm gonna welcome that as soon as we're done with the, with the pr short presentation. But um, th we have even have uncertainty in physics. And we know more about predicting the, the positions of uh, nebulae uh, light years away than I do about what will happen if I push um, this, uh, this bottle across this table. So we do have methods for dealing with these kind of uncertainty and it comes out of the field of statistics and probability. That's been around for a very long time. But unfortunately, the distributions we have to deal with in the real world look like this. They're multimodal, non-parametric. So they're not so easy to deal with. We do have tools for addressing this, which look like this. We use particle filters and numerical sampling. So Monte Carlo techniques. The problem is that these don't scale well. As you increase the, no the complexity of the distributions, you need more particles, and as you have higher dimensions, everything scales exponentially. Now fortunately, you have access to vast amounts of computing. So the cloud computing means that any robot can tap into a center maybe not instantaneously, but maybe after a short delay, and get access to a vast amount of computing that can be done remotely. So this is, these are some of the other advantages. Cloud computing gives us access to, to being able to do statistical motion planning in high dimensional spaces. It also opens the door to open source. So we are now having people share code and designs at unprecedented levels. And the last thing, the last advantage has to do with robots learning. So this is what I want to talk about in three parts, uh, three subparts uh, that are projects that are going on in my, in my lab at Berkeley. So the first has to do with grasping, and it, it's something that was recognized by Hans Moravec over 30 years ago, and he said what's, what's hard for humans, like precision spot welding, is, uh, what's hard for, is, is easy for robots. Did I get that right? And what's easy for humans, like clearing the dinner table, is incredibly hard for robots. So that's a paradox, and it continues to this day. So something like this, which uh, you know, a child, an infant basically, can easily stack blocks like this. We aren't surprised by that. 
no robot can do this. It turns out to be incredibly hard. And it has to do with the picking the parts out of that bag that are really part of the challenge. And this is a challenge we're facing right now because major companies are want to be able to have to be able to deliver orders to us at rapidly increasing speeds. So you want to click in and you want to get something some weird combination, a, a hairbrush and a copy of uh, Das Kapital, and um, <laughs> you know suddenly you that arrives on your on your on your doorstep. Well, how does that happen? Well, it's because these they have both of those things in this vast warehouse with about 10 million other objects. How do we put those together? And so companies like Amazon and Walmart and others are trying to figure this out, and they have a lot of technologies and efforts going into trying to, to address it. But it's a very hard problem, because what humans do effortlessly, again, still is very, very difficult for robots. And so it's a grand challenge right now, and this was said by, by Rod Brooks, one of, the, one of the top researchers in the field, uh, that, that, that the grand challenge is that the ability to grasp millions of different objects will have significant impact on factories, warehouses, and homes. So we've been interested in this, and there have been advances in computer vision. So there's a, uh, this is a, I love this video, it's, uh, it's this running in superhuman speeds, right? It's tagging and labeling images, some parts of images uh, of, uh, this is a James Bond film, it's very, it's an excellent choice there. And, uh, but it's it basically, this is, we are, computer vision has made huge advances. So it turns out that that is result of vast amounts of data. So people have labeled those images, other images, and that has been used to train a deep learning system to be able to do what you just saw. So what we're interested in at Berkeley is can we do something analogous for grasping and manipulation? So we want to have a data set of, of, of data like we have in vision, but we want to do something similar for three-dimensional objects that we can practice on, train on, for grasping and manipulation. So the nice thing is that it turns out that there's a lot of new three-dimensional models out there because of 3D printing. So we can start to incorporate these. And what we've done is something that we call the dexterity network. We're building uh, a very large network of three-dimensional object models, and we're using those to learn to train a system to be able to do grasping. So here's the idea. We have these objects. So here's a typical object in the set. And what we're going to do is consider many different places we could grasp that object. So right, there's, there's many different um, potential grasps for the object. And what we're, um, for each grasp, we're going to apply some physics to it. And this is well known. This physics goes back over 100 years. If you have all the perfect information, you can determine whether it's going to um, be s held securely. Um, but what we're interested in, particularly, is this uncertainty. So what we're doing is we're going to sample perturbations in the position and orientation of the object and the gripper. So that's what you see here. We're trying out little changes. And we're seeing, does the grasp still work? right? And what we want is something called a robust grasp. We want a grasp that's insensitive to these perturbations. So in this case, we could do this using Monte Carlo sampling. We're going to sample lots of distributions and integrate the results to be able to find that grasp that maximizes the probability that the grasp will succeed. So we could do this. The computation is non-trivial, though, because for every object in the set has about 1,000 faces. A grasp is a pair of faces, so that's 1,000 times 1,000, a million different possible grasps. For each grasp, we're going to look at about 1,000 perturbations. So that's about a billion evaluations for, the, for, the, for, an op, for one object. And we have about 14,000 objects, so we're talking about 14 trillion grasp evaluations. So this is, this is non-trivial computation. And this is the kind of thing, by the way, that it can um, do. It will find out that the grasp on the left, which is stable but is not robust, is, much, is, is not nearly as robust as the grasp on the right. The grasp on the right is insensitive to the perturbations. So we do this computation in the cloud. And we're working with Google on a prototype of this. And we have it running on 1,500 nodes out there on the, on the network. And we're able to get some interesting results. We still found that it takes a long time to do this computation. So we're using techniques like multi-arm bandits. And we are using we are using deep networks to be able to do uh, similarity construction, to make kernels, to be able to feed the multi-arm bandit information, which is basically trying to optimize the order of which grasp to try next. And deep learning, as I mentioned, is an extremely interesting set of results. In this particular problem, it actually solves it much better than anything we had before, which is that it can, if given an object, it can find another object that's similar in our data set faster than anything else. 
So we've been able to show through experiments, and we have papers on this, that, um, that the kind of graphs we can, we can um, compute, we can compute them much faster, and uh, they're higher quality graphs than if we didn't have these techniques. Now, one thing I also want to point out to you really quickly about a, uh, a real, what I see as a real potential Achilles heel for deep learning. So look at this uh, image, these five images on the top. So we have a deep learning system that can be trained to recognize or classify them all properly. That's really pretty impressive, actually. So it you can show it in any of these images, and it comes up with those labels as you see. But it turns out that you can make a very small change to all those images. And you show the, see the images on the bottom? Well, they look almost the same as the images on the top. But when you do the classification, they all come out as mushroom. <laughs> so that's a problem, because that means that the neural network is somehow misclassifying all those images. And if you think about it, that's going to be a real problem if we have an uh, autonomous car system that's relying on this, because it's going to come up and see a stop sign, and actually it's a, it, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's a stop sign, and it thinks it's a yield sign. Okay, That could be fatal. So I want to just point out that this is, a, this is a very big issue a lot of researchers are, are wrestling with right now. And we're trying to do something analogous, analogous in the realm of grasping. So we're looking at adversarial grasp objects. That is, objects that are difficult to grasp. Because it's pretty easy to grasp a cylinder or a box. But these things, not so easy. And we're generating them, finding them online, and then downloading them and generating three-dimensional, um, uh, uh, 3D printed versions of them so that we can do experiments in the lab. Now, these other groups are doing this also, and they're starting to look at the idea of, can we basically have a robot sitting out there that just tries things over and over again? This idea of reinforcement learning. And it's just going to train itself. And so groups have done this, and sometimes spending like 700 robot hours just trying over and over, and they get up to about 80% success. And then last year, this was reported at Google, about uh, 8,000 hours, and they got up to like 90% success. So it's, it's interesting, but what you worry about is, well, if you want to get up to the kind of success levels you want for a factory, how long am I going to have to keep trying things? So this is a fundamental challenge right now. We're hitting this asymptote. So in our new version, what we call DexNet 2.0, we, we have a, a new version of this that actually now takes the data from DexNet 1.0 and uses it as the basis to train a network to go directly from a three-dimensional point cloud to a grasp. So I have a very short video. If they, we have the sound for this, I'll just play this video. It's just about 90 seconds. ...a huge variety of objects. And you see where this automation science is at. We're developing the dexterity network, which combines deep learning with cloud robotics to learn robust grasping policies. DexNet is designed to facilitate grasping adversarial objects with irregular, difficult-to-grasp shapes. The first version of the system, DexNet 1.0, Use analytic and statistical sampling methods to analyze the robustness of thousands of candidate grasps for each object using a library of 10,000 3D objects. In a new version of the system, DexNet 2.0, we generate 6 million synthetic point clouds and use them to train the deep learning network to recognize robust grasps. The resulting grass quality convolutional neural network can rapidly analyze point clouds to find robust grasps. To evaluate DexNet 2.0, we performed physical experiments with test objects not included in the training set. DexNet 2.0 is three times faster than the previous version, and in experiments with 40 novel test objects, of all the grasps the system predicted would succeed, only one failed. So we're continuing to explore this. I am not claiming in any way that we've solved this problem, but we're really excited about this result. It's very promising. The, and I also want to make it clear that, this, we are, that robots are just being able to put, pick things out of boxes and put them into other boxes, but we're nowhere near being able to take on jobs like this. So it's super important if you're a mechanic or a plumber, um, your job is safe. Okay? And this is true for people working in, 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 in kitchens, in many different environments, that uh, all this kind of manual labor is extremely difficult for robots. All right, let me come to the surgery. So you may be familiar with Intuitive Surgical. It's a hugely successful company. They have 3,000 robots out there in, in operating rooms. But the thing to keep in mind is that each one of these are controlled by a human, by a surgeon. They're following the motions of the surgeon. So the way it works is like this. The surgeon is out off in one corner moving the controls, and then inside the body, the robot is mimicking the exact motions. So in some sense, it's really a puppet. All right? it's, not, it's not doing anything autonomous. 
So what we've been exploring, though, is could we actually give it a little bit of autonomy? And we're not talking about replacing the surgeon. We're talking about assisting. So just like in driver assist, we are going to help the, help the surgeon by, like, like just in the same way that you have systems now that can help you with parking or staying in your lane, this is the kind of thing we're, we're talking about. And we're excited because the idea is, can we start to do this by observing the motions of human surgeons? So what we're starting to do is take data from human surgeons, and then uh, basically by observing them, recording them, and then inferring models, control policies, from those, from those examples that can allow us to perform these three things that, we just, that we're showing here. Now be aware, these are speeded up, but these are examples of tedious tasks that we would like, that surgeons would like to be able to be relieved of so that they can concentrate on the really complicated and nuanced aspects of surgery. So just looking at circle cutting, for example, this is actually a, a, a surgical resident. All surgical residents have to do this in their training, and it's hard to control the system to do this accurately. And we were able to get up to about 80% accuracy, but the way we do it is we, we first of all take this data from expert surgeons, and it looks like this. It's just like a hairball of, uh, of data. And what we have to do is we have to analyze it and break it up into segments. And then we can get this, this performance that you see here, which is that we learn an underlying policy that's consistent with all the demonstrations. Now, I also want to make it clear that we're not uh, about to replace the surgeons. Um, it's not going into operating rooms anytime soon. That uh, we still have about a 20% failure rate. And as you can see here, this is the way the system can fail. And I think it's really important that roboticists in all the labs come out and show their blooper reels. Because we have to show that these things are not, we're not almost there yet. And now, the idea, though, is in the future, as we have bigger data sets, could we collect over the cloud data from surgeons all over the world, from these 3,000 systems in all these operating rooms, especially from the really good ones, the really expert surgeons who have been doing this for years, who really have these nuanced skills. If we can monitor their trajectories, we can train our systems to be better and better. The last example I want to give you right now is, uh, is in the realm of agriculture. So in California, as you know, we've had problems with drought, not this year, but we've had in the past and we may in the future. And we have been uh, looking at could robots assist in, in providing precision agriculture. So I have another quick, sh quick video here. Water shortages and droughts are increasingly common in California and worldwide. Currently, 85% of fresh water is used for agriculture, and much of that is lost by overwatering. Our goal is to conserve water with precision irrigation at the plant level. Recent advances in infrared sensing and UAVs now make it possible to monitor conditions from the air to identify plants that are receiving too much or too little water. A key challenge is how to close the loop, adjusting the flow of water at the plant level in response to this data. One approach is to use electronic valves. However, these are prohibitively expensive and prone to failures. A new research project funded by USDA grant will explore an alternative, rapid robot-assisted precision irrigation delivery, where portable devices will adjust low-cost passive valves that cost far less than electronic valves. The rapid system will employ the innate skills of human workers for locomotion and dexterity. GPS and RFID wireless technology will identify which valves to adjust and by what amount, based on data and weather predictions, to direct human workers to which valves need adjustment. Okay, so this is another example of people and robots working together. In other words, how do we make use of the cloud to pull in information from many different sources and deep learning to aggregate and, and analyze that information and then use that back to empower human workers to go out into the field and make these adjustments? So these are just three examples of this very large and growing area of cloud robotics. I also want to say that I think that this is going to have impact in many other industries as well, not just in, in, in uh, warehouses and in, in surgery or agriculture, but in all kinds of different fields. The, the, the potential is very great. I was also, we've been hearing a lot about the Internet of Things, and this has extended a similar idea of cloud robotics, but to, but, to, but to sensors and switches, things that may not be robots, but just all kinds of devices that might be in our environments. And you've heard about Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. This is also very much predicated on the ideas of using the cloud. And in China, they have something analogous called Made in China 2025, which is to really revolutionize manufacturing, again, using robots in the cloud. Now, I also want to say, I know about Skynet, yes. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, we're not exactly summoning the demon here. We're, uh, we're very aware of that there are, are dangers and, and risks. One is that as soon as you're relying on the network, you have to worry about network latency and variability, quality of service. And more importantly, I think, is worried about privacy and security. Because as soon as you have a robot that's connected over the cloud, that means someone can possibly tap into it and control it remotely. So I'm very, I want to keep, keep our eyes open that this is not just Pollyanna situation. All right, let's switch to the last part, which is how to prepare. Now, I'm very aware that we are living in a time of great unrest and um, um, unfairness, um, un inequality. And people want jobs. This is a huge issue right now. And I want to, I want to say, though, that I'm, I'm worried that we're also, the, the, what this is spilling into is, a, is a, this form of automation anxiety. People are feeling a great deal of anxiety that somehow the automation is going to cause them accelerate the loss of jobs and, the lo and, the, and, and create more inequality. And then remember, this is a very old, old fear. I mean, going back to the early days of robots, right, they always seem to get loose and uh, do something that we didn't anticipate. And there, that was the idea that robots were going to take over. That's not new. And of course, this goes actually even way back to Prometheus and the ancient Greeks and all up through uh, Western culture from the Golem to Frankenstein. And this is uh, actually the subtitle of Frankenstein was the modern Prometheus. It's a whole idea of hubris and we have to be careful what we wish for. That these technologies are very complex and powerful and they may get out of control. It's also related, I think, to a lot of uh, concerns that people have about immigrants. So when you're worried about jobs, the first thing you turn to is, it's the immigrants. They're going to come and they steal our jobs. It's a very old trope. And in fact, we've seen it here in, in California. A hundred years ago, it was the Chinese that were going to steal our jobs. And there was talk about the yellow peril at that time. And then I think whether it's the, then it was the Italians and it was the, the Jews. So it's always the Jews, but they, uh, there's always some scapegoat out there. And, um, and so I think it's really interesting that Oliver Morton at The Economist made the point that, well, robots really are, are, are the latest immigrants that we're blaming for a loss of our jobs. And they're not immigrants from another country, they're immigrants from the future. And I think this very, very deep point he's making here, and I think it bears more discussion, and we'll do that later. So who's right? Um, you know, is, is all this a, a really a threat or an opportunity? I mean, the, the word singularity, I think, is particularly problematic. And I know we have some people from Singularity University, and I'm not tacking you, but, um, because I don't think you're, fo you're, you're focusing on this, but that word is a, is a focal point. That is, a lot of people have a lot, the focal point for a lot of the fear. So I'd like to propose a, an alternative tonight. It's something I call multiplicity. So rather than a monolithic AI that's coming to take over and dominate and, and basically surpass humans, multiplicity is really about robots and humans working together. And one idea of this is to realize that actually this, this is well known in the fields of com computer science and statistics that um, if you look at something like you want to do some classification, well, you can use something called a, a statistical decision tree, and you, can, you, you measure the performance on a data set. But it was recently observed that you can, um, you can extend this by uh, taking a number of decision trees, what's called a random forest, and then combining all of their results, and you get much better performance. So when you compare a, uh, a single tree to a, to a collection of trees, we can provably show that the collection does better. And the key factor of this is that the trees have to be sufficiently diverse, sufficiently different. If they're all the same, if you have homogeneous trees, you don't get the benefit. But when they're diverse, you do. Now, similar things have been observed in the realm of humans, putting people together. So we've been, there have been experiments recently where you do people solving problems and you put different groups of people together. And when those people are homogeneous, you get a certain level of performance. But when there's a diversity, when you have different people, different backgrounds, different histories, different cultures, different ways of thinking, they come up with better results. And it's because people think differently. I really object to this idea of the IQ, where there's a one linear dimension, everybody's got a slot on it. It doesn't make any sense. Intelligence is not a one-dimensional axis. There's many dimensions. It's super high-dimensional, and people have many different strengths in many different direction, dimensions. 
And so the key here is, is a, it's a reminder, what this is all teaching us is that the value, the importance of diversity, diversity in thought, neurodiversity. It's, it's a way of reminding ourselves that, that diversity in hiring is not just about correcting a historic wrong or being politically correct. It's actually get about getting better performance. So I want to come back to this idea. I think multiplicity is something we should be thinking about and trying to understand. It's not well understood. There's no science of multiplicity right now. How can we combine groups of machines with groups of humans in appropriate ways to get them to perform v uh, most effectively? And by the way, I want to say this is still hap this is happening right now. And if you look at the Google search engine, which is which is an example of AI. Uh, by any means, and a remarkable one, that you can type in a word and, a, and exactly the page you're looking for comes up. That is a result of multiplicity. It's lots of different algorithms working on lots of different data. And that data is provided by us. If, you, if we stop providing data in the form of clicks and confirmations and input, very quickly in about a week, the Google search engine would start deteriorating and degrading. It constantly needs to be fed by our activity, our data. And this is also true for all these systems. So when systems at Amazon um, or, or music or, or news feeds or movies, they're all basically making recommendations but based on data that we're providing, based on human data. So it's not AI in a sense of some computer basically analyzing all this. It's basically looking for patterns in the things that we do. So coming back to cloud robotics, I'm very excited about the potential of the cloud as a way of starting to integrate data from many different sources. And um, I also want to say that we, we, there's some big questions I have about the future of automated driving. And we hopefully we'll ask questions about that because I, I don't think we're going to see autonomous, fully autonomous cars on the road in the foreseeable future. It's a much harder problem than we think. Even though everybody keeps talking about it as though it's about to happen any day now, I am very skeptical because it's a very hard problem. We need lots of data. And as Pete alluded to earlier, I wrote a, a piece in the, op in the Wall Street Journal recently where I said, look, it's not a matter of us versus the machines. This is the old way of thinking. It's really about us working with machines. And so the new way is to start thinking about diverse groups of people working together with machines. And we have computers have a seat at the table. It's just another form of neuro think another form of thinking so we have to understand what can they do and use it rather than fearing it now by the way if we go back a hundred years as we were talking about earlier actually technology at that time did have an effect on the way we think so at that time there was the advances of agriculture and so there was um the, the many new machines coming into to the farms and rather than just sort of worry about this, people started thinking and they came up with a very interesting response, which is they changed education. So farm automation led to something called the high school movement. And it was around 1910, all over the country, they started promoting the idea that people should stay in high school. And they built high schools. This is Mount Tam High, uh, where right up here in, uh, in Marin, and it was built in 1910. And what happened is that at 1910, only 10% of Americans graduated from high school. But this new curriculum and emphasis and new building resulted that by 1950, 80% of Americans had finished high school. This was, um, technology had changed the way we teach, the way we educate. So I think there's possibility for this in the future. And so what I think we should be thinking about is not fearing this idea of AI, but starting to embrace it, think about it as an opportunity, and combining it with IA, intelligence amplification. These two things can really work together. And we can start to understand what are the strengths and relative power, uh, 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 pro uh, benefits of each. And so I think this can change school, schooling. We have an opportunity to really rethink it. So rather than the old way of schooling, which is all about conformity and, and do the right thing and get it, you know, you follow the rules, we're now thinking about schooling, or hopefully we will, about teaching creativity. And there the emphasis is on diversity, variety, uh, resistance, and innovation. So what computers and robots and AI are good at is calculations. We're good at understanding. They're good at precision, we're good at having purpose. They're good at objectivity, and we have passion. So these are the things that humans are very good at. And we need to recognize and appreciate and strengthen them. 
So the idea that what we do is we have curiosity, creativity, empathy, these are human skills, and we, are, we can teach them, we can, we can enhance them in the future. I, I, I saw that slide from Tiffany. Um, okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here, and I'll, I'll leave it with this just to, re just to recap. So we started with, with three things. What isn't new, so the way to think about that is, if you think about, about Einstein, remember relativity, right? Technology has always been advancing. What is new? Connect the bots, right? This whole idea of, of cloud robotics. And the last one is how we can prepare. Multiply our multiplicity. Thank you. Keep that. Wow, a lot to think about there. This is if, what, this could be a tweet. We could play, this could be. <laughs> You could basically get it out there to the world. Um, well, folks, we're going to just roll into the conversation part here. And the conversation is with you, as well as Ken. But Ken, why don't you sit over here, if you want to? And uh, we're gonna, I'm just going to ask a couple questions to get going here. But basically, we're going to be passing it around here. There are folks, in fact, I think Sunil Paul, who led the last Time, the last session on automated vehicles is here, so you can kind of, he'll have some things. I know there's people from Singularity, there's a bunch of folks in here that I think can have a really interesting discussion here. Um, but to start out, it's like, okay, Elon Musk is a smart guy, right? And, uh, and it's not just him, there's a bunch of folks going on here. So how do you, given what you laid out here, it seems so clear and so persuasive and so compelling, what is going on then? Are they just taking a longer time horizon, or are they doing some? Are they making some fundamental missteps here? Just kind of explain that disconnect, actually, in terms of what you know in your field and what is really being freaked out about by very smart dudes in that space. Right. I mean, Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, others are, 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 are and, and even my colleagues, some of my colleagues at Berkeley. I mean, I, I and I'm not claiming I know. Okay, I'm not claiming it's not going to happen, but. Most of the colleagues that I have then working in the field of AI and robotics agree that this idea, this talk of singularity, is very, very far off in the distance. And I think that, look, I don't know what Elon's motivations are. He's a very smart person, there's no doubt. He knows a lot about batteries, space travel, <laughs> cars. He's never done any work in AI, okay? But he, he, he has a group, he has OpenAI, he's got a group of researchers, some of whom I, I, I know well, and they're, they're exploring it. But, you know, I think that you have to go in with, uh, I feel it's important to have reasonable expectations rather than inflated expectations. And we've seen this over and over again, it's a very common pattern. And then what happens is the bubble bursts and then there's a huge backlash because AI didn't pan out and then all the funding dries up and people move on to something else. And what I think we need to do is just tamp that down and say, let's be realistic about what's happening now rather than predicting you know, the imminent demise of humanity. So when you, say, when you say the very, very far future, I mean, in, in your mind, and again, not holding you to this, but that kind of very sophisticated robotics and very sophisticated AI, the her and kind of ex machina world, I mean, are we talking maybe never and may, if so, 100 years from now kind of thing? Or are you, are you talking, what, wh when you say very far, when are you thinking? I'm thinking 100 years at least. Here's the thing that we, we can have robots, there's you know the Turing test, right? And every year there's a competition to, to have a Turing test and people have chat bots that sometimes you call and, and something's talking to you and you suddenly realize, wait, it's a machine, right? Okay, it's pretty easy to fool humans, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that's okay, but to have, just be able to really sit down and have a long-term conversation with a computer that requires so much knowledge about what's going on in the world and nuances about language and, 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 and implications about how humans are perform and, and interact with the physical world. It's, uh, it's, it's mind boggling. And just like understanding the brain, even though we can, we think, we, we see it and we can wrap our hands around it, but we can't understand it. So I think it's a real, a real, real um, it's very important to have humility around these things. The other thing I think is you're working with robotics and you're showing how crude in some respects the robots are. I, is it possible to, uh, but we tend to group AI and robotics together, but AI kind of disembodied AI, which is more kind of 
I, you know, right. mind work rather than kind of physical robotics. Should we be thinking about those differently, or is it legit to kind of group them together in these discussions? It's a good question. We, you know, traditionally we had been thinking about se them very separately. So there's separate tracks of conferences and uh, different journals. Uh, mostly, really, it's been interesting in the last few years. We've started to embrace AI as a term, as, as really a, a general term that includes robots. But you're right. I mean, certainly there's realms like language translation and and and, and pattern recognition that are, don't involve robots. And so the, I, I just want to point out, those are difficult in their own right to be able to do. I mean, Google Translate is pretty good. You get the sense of what's going on, but it's not giving you like real nuanced translations. And we can talk more about that, but my sister's a linguist and she's like, We're, we don't know how to do this at all. And the same is, uh, and I just want to say, is uh, all those problems are very, very hard, and then robotics is just that much harder. The other thing I think is people keep thinking about the singularity, and again, I don't want to speak for the folks here, but as you know, the, 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 the exponential increase in Mo Moore's Law and all these kind of trackings that we've experienced in the last couple of decades or even three, three or four decades, but that aren't necessarily, in fact, people are saying th some things are slowing down. Is that again a kind of a mental mistake of just that extension of what we're used to and not really understanding ba fundamental barriers ahead of us right ahead? Well, thanks for saying that, Peter. I, I, I do think that Moore's Law, there's, there's some people call, call it Moore's curse. And what they mean by that is that we've had this unbelievable run of progress with computing over the last 20 years. And it's really, it is astounding. But it, it's, it's, a, it's something that looks locally exponential. Some things cannot continue exponentially that long. They're going to they're gonna asymptote. So you're really talking about a sigmoidal curve where the progress is going to flatten out. It's just inevitable. And so we are starting to see that, even though I know we'll get a lot of pushback on this, and, uh, but, but, but people like Dave Patterson is really at the forefront. He says, the fr he sa he says we're at the end of Moore's Law. And it's also true for, for memory and other factors. So um, I still think we're going to see advances. But again, computing alone is not going to solve, solve these challenges. And are there some things, uh, I mean, this is a final question, so we're going to be going to the crowd here, so think about what you're doing. We're going to run your mics here in a second. But um, you mentioned some very human things, instinct, intuition, empathy. I mean, are these, even in, your, in the wildest dreams, are those things that are really just beyond machines at some level and that will always have this multiplicity, uh, the use for the kind of unique kind of problem-solving capabilities of humans? I think so. I mean, I don't think we're going to see a robot or AI system ever telling a good joke. Uh, I'm waiting for that, or a poem, or a song. I mean, really, occasionally it'll stumble on something, and someone will say, listen, this was generated by, you know, this news article was written by a robot. It's like, oh, yeah, but it's just a, that could have probably been done with uh, Mad Libs. I mean, that's not super sophisticated. And every once in a while, a poem will pop out, but it's like it's generated 10,000 poems, and one was decent. That this is uh, what I want to say is that the nuances of human human interaction are so subtle, and rely on emotion and factors that in history and our experience in the lived world, and these are very very hard. So the the good news is I think um, that means that there's a lot of uh, room for humans, and so we're we're not going away. We're we're going to be needed for for really the foreseeable long f beyond the foreseeable future. Not only my lifetime, but my daughter Odessa's lifetime, and many of yours. I mean, I think that that's, that's the message I want to leave you with is, it's not discouraging, and I don't want to be negative about technology, because I work on it every day, and I really believe that it's important to, to put as much money and resources behind it and train our students in technology. It's not that I'm saying AI is a, is a dead end, but I'm saying that we, we have to understand how it's progressing. And it is a slow pro march forward, and we're making progress. But don't fear that suddenly, because of these recent nice wave of advances, that we're suddenly going to surpass humans. And with that, let's turn to the human brains in the audience here, of which there are many. <laughs> and we have uh, Emma here in the back has a um, has uh, one of the mics, and we're going to remic him in a different way here. But oh my God, let's. Uh, Let's just start here, right in the front row here, we got one here. I'm Rohit, I work with Capgemini, so hi. Uh, so my question is, if I look at my you know, past like six or seven years, uh, I've had a heavy influence of automation and AI, like for example, spell check is there, there's calendars, reminder, blah, blah, blah. 
And I feel like I'm getting dumber and dumber by the day, right? Because I'm overly relying on, on these things. I cannot do a simple math anymore. You ask me to spell Massachusetts, I'll have to think 10 times before I spell it. So I feel like there's a lot of innate uh, characteristics that I had as a person before this uh, whole you know, advancement of technology. I'm losing some of it. And if you look at the newer generation, like the kids, they're losing the ability to even hold a conversation because they're really good at texting back and forth 25 messages per second. Try to have a real conversation, they fail. So how do you respond to this kind of a concept? And I'm not trying to tell everyone is like that, I'm, I'm, I'm dumb. But, uh, <laughs> but how do you respond to something like that? Uh, how do we, yeah, I, I think you get my question. Okay, good, no, I love the okay. okay, so you know, spell checking and being able to, to, to do um, some co computations, right? Um, we're losing that ability, but I, I'm not so worried about that because uh, we're gaining new capabilities. So, you know, I don't think we, we, it's nice, I think, for rigor to understand how to do multiplication, long multiplication and division, all those things, but really, I'm happy to let the machines do that stuff and do the spell checking and lots of other things, sorting and all kinds of finding things on the web, right? I'm happy to, to offload that. But it almost puts my mind up to being able to do other things. And our kids are learning new skills. So when you say they're spending all this time on social media, they're figuring out some other stuff. They are learning, and they're figuring out how to communicate and, and tell stories visually and how to, how to mine information at an amazing rate. So I'm seeing the students that are coming in now are smarter than ever before, dramatically, over the last 20 years. Students that, that I'm seeing at the university, amazingly, uh, just incredible increase in their abilities and talents and, and intellects. And it's because, I believe, it's because they've used the internet, they've used all these tools. So rather than seeing it as something taking away from you, certain skills, in the same way that jobs, we will all lose some skills, we'll lose some jobs, but we'll also open the ways for many new ones. Let's give it, I know there's a lot of hands here, but let's give it to David Duncan here, who's writing a book on robotics. So I, 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 I think, right there. And could you stand up a minute? Hi, yeah, David Duncan, thank you, Pete, for introducing me. Um, and thanks, Ken, for a really spectacular presentation. I'm sort of curious about, uh, you, you mentioned uh, backlash against new technologies when they're overhyped. And, you know, I, I don't know how people feel here, but I think it's fair to say that AI is in a certain hype cycle. And I don't think we've quite hit the peak yet, actually. And a lot of investors and entrepreneurs say, I have to say AI in my presentation or I don't get funding. So uh, fair to say, and we've seen this happen with other technologies. But I'm wondering, um, you know, first of all, I think you do agree with that, but uh, is that going to cause a backlash? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I, I think we're already starting to see little glimmers of this. I mean, just like in all bubbles, right? Everyone wants to say in the middle of it, this time is different. And you hear that. But, um, but I, as soon as someone starts saying that, that's the time to start <laughs> get, get your income. Um, because the, uh, it's, 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 it's so similar, the trajectory, and we're, we're accelerating very, very fast, so fast right now, as you said, everybody in the Valley is talking about AI and their companies. And we've seen actually six waves of what's called AI winters. If you go back to the 60s, just, just search for AI winter, you'll see the history. It's actually quite remarkable, going back to the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, that um, there were similar things. You can find articles in the New York Times saying very similar things to what we're hearing today from 1980. And then there was a huge crash and backlash. So maybe it's good in the sense that, like any forest fire, it clears the way for new ideas. But I just want us to be alert to this possibility that we're kind of over-hyping right now. And I would, li I would like the hype. I'm, I'm, I'm loving every minute of it, believe me. But I just think we need to tone it down a little bit so it doesn't like get out of control. Okay, I, I, I know there's a lot of hands here, but I do want to give Sunil, who basically is a tonic vehicle <laughs> champion okay. back there. And, and, uh, he, he's presented earlier. I just thought I'd give him one, too. Oop. Hello, hello. There we go. Hi, I'm Sunil. Um, so what occurs to me when, you're, when you gave this talk is, uh, first of all, right on. But what are we doing wrong that... Um, that so many people are so freaked out and bought into this, I mean, I get it, there's this mythology that I think you present 
really well, that is a recurring theme. But what responsibility do we have as technologists, as scientists, to, to somehow communicate better so that it's better understood that, you know, there's seven times as many e-commerce jobs as retail jobs that got laid off or that there takes three times as many people to fly a drone as to fly a jet. Like, that information somehow doesn't get out, but, you know, singularity and the greatest threat to civilization does. What can we do better? I thought you were going to tag me about the cars, because, um, um, okay. okay, you agree. I mean, it's interesting because, yeah, I think for all companies, too, we need to watch our expectations, and it's up to the, the technologists. I do think that for us to speak out about this and say the, the, what's, what's happening, what is, where the progress is happening, but also not overhype it. And, of course, the journalists want to sell papers. I understand, it's, it's, a, it's, it's very natural. And they want the story to say, hey, it's not as bad as you think. That doesn't make a headline. So I think it's, it's just a matter of us being, being, being selective, you know, being able to understand these, um, these rumors. And you know, I heard that Snopes is actually in a crisis right now. But things like that, where basically you can debunk some of the mythologies as they're coming out and they're pushing back on it. So I think that we all have that responsibility to read carefully, read between the lines, not just accept everything that we're seeing. And especially even the New York Times, I have to say, it's amazing how much they have adopted this meme of, you know, the jobs are, gonna, are, are, are going, we're going to be wiped out. I mean, really read it carefully because it, it infuriates me when I read my favorite newspaper kind of going on down this path that is, is not borne out by the facts. And if you read, if you talk to economists and people like John Zeisman, who's back here, they, they're really studying these issues and they know that actually it's not the case, that historically jobs are created. So we don't know exactly where that mix is all going to fall out. And, and that's the other thing, nobody can predict. Like, I'm not going to tell you everything's going to end up rosy. Okay, I can't say that with any certainty either. Maybe something will happen. Maybe it'll be a huge advance. We just haven't seen that yet. So what I want to say is like we can relax a bit <laughs> and, and concentrate on other things. Right here, how about right here? Can you stand? Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question goes to. Introduce this, yourself. Uh, my name is Chris. Um, and my question goes to um, this issue of empathy. Um, is there a thing we can do, or is there such a thing as empathy at scale? Or is there a thing as a person who's developing the tools? you can do to make sure that robotics don't adapt um, some of the worst human behaviors, like you know, getting data and like the robot turns out to be racist and things like that. I think it's something we have to be really, really careful about. And one of the things in, in the deep learning systems is that they're very hard to, they, they're, they're, they're hard to, they're opaque. In other words, it's hard to understand why they make the decisions they make. And when those decisions have to do with things like granting mortgages or decisions about uh, parole, uh, their people's lives are at stake. Those require very subtle and nuanced factors. And, 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 and so I am very wary about the trend toward turning these decisions over to machines of any kind. So I don't think, I haven't seen evidence that we can, that we can automate empathy. But I think that's where humans are going to come in. That we are very good at it. All of us. I and mean, we could probably be better. I know I could be. I could be more patient. I could be all these things. I have to work on it. But because I think that that's my, my point is that the good news here is that this AI and, and robots, what we're learning, what they're teaching us, what they're reminding us is that what the things that we do well and that we can enhance them, that's a huge opportunity. That's a very positive, positive thing. So rather, I guess I'm always coming back to this thing of rather than worrying about um, the, what the computers are, are going to do, that we should start really, uh, seeing as what, what are the new things that we're going to be able to do. Is there any, um, anybody has a strong opinion um, about countering actually where he's coming from? Is there someone from the singular, right, right here, let's, uh, is that what you said? You have a counter kind of point here? Hi, I'm Deborah. Um, you talked about neurodiversity, but when you show how you're training computers to see, it reminds me a lot of an autistic brain. You're giving them a database of 500 
mugs. I don't see a mug, I just see a handle, an approximate size and whether it's got liquid or not. So how do you move from thinking like an autistic brain to thinking like a neurotypical brain when you're teaching a machine to see? And I also question your um, assumption that people want jobs. Do they want jobs or do they just want the income that jobs can, can give them? And therefore, is, there, is this more an economic question than a redundancy question? Okay, great, great questions. Thank you, Susan, right? Um, so the first one, by the way, there's a new film that just, uh, just showed um, in the Jewish Film Festival called Keep the Change, and it's about a, a love affair between two autistic um, uh, individuals, and it's a wonderful insight into that, the, 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 this, um, uh, that, 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 that we all in this room are, are neurotypical, and we should expand our thinking about what thinking should be. Uh, to, and, I, and I agree with you, Lisa, I, I, I think this idea of looking at lots of examples and then trying to just train from that is, um, it has, is limiting in certain ways. What is cupness? Right? <laughs> Philosophers have worried about this for a long time. And just showing a lot of cups doesn't really get at it. So I don't have an answer to that. I, I don't know. Well, we're, what we're trying is different approaches to getting robots to be able to, to pick a cup and pack it into a box. But it's just not going to understand the nature of cups. Um, the, the second part was about, jobs. about jobs. jobs. Oh, so do people want jobs? Okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm not qualified to answer that, really. I, but I believe, I'll just go out on a hypothetical here, but I think people really do. I think if people get a huge amount of value and purpose from having a job, I don't think people really want, given, this, given the choice of just having you know, the minimum subsistence, universal basic income coming in the mail, I don't think that's an answer. I think that's going to demoralize people at the same time. It'll help out a lot of people. And here's the thing, why I want to be really careful. I don't want to be going out on a limb here and I'm, I'm not qualified. So let me stop now because that's not what I do. That's not what I know. So the one thing I want to say is I know what I, know, what I don't know. And most people, I think everyone needs to learn more about that. You, you mentioned your colleague, John Zeiss. Does John have anything to say on that one? He's right there. No, I'm perfectly happy to just listen. <laughs> All right, there's a woman way in the back there who had her hand up. Hi, my name is Joy, and I have a question along similar lines to the previous one. But um, looking at the multiplicity, you were talking about diversity being important and talking about collective intelligence. And um, how do you see not so much robotics, but machine learning playing a role in the collection and filtering and sorting and listening to of all those voices. Because th that can be so powerful in municipalities, governments. OK, uh, thank you for asking that. Because I, I do have a project I didn't talk about tonight. But we have just such a project also going on at Berkeley. And it's, it's called Opinion Space. And it's a, it's a platform and a set of tools that essentially uses the power of computing to be able to solicit input from many different people, from a diverse group of people and then combine it in ways that are fair, so that it doesn't turn out that one person gets to dominate the conversation, as so often happens today. So we've been looking at that problem too, and I do think that there's some hope that we can develop tools that will be able to manage that kind of inflow of information in a better way. So every time you see a newspaper article and then all the comments, which just feels like, oh God, I have to read those comments. But, um, but actually, if we could sort and organize those comments in some sort of sensible way, it would that would essentially not just show polarity, polar, cyber polarization, but would actually call out those, those, those needles in the haystack and really interesting insights and present those in a, in a really um, complex and diverse way. That, I, I do think that would be wonderful. And it's probably with something through, with higher dimensional projections and, uh, and, and spatial models, because just seeing them as a linear list doesn't seem to work. Got a, we got a woman here in the second. Hi, my name is Arvashi, and I am a journalist. Um, and I, you know, there's been a lot of talk about jobs and how it's something that's, you know, been overblown. But, I mean, when you look at a lot of the research that's out there, it's pretty clear that it's low-paying jobs that are the ones that are going to be lost. Um, and yes, there's going to be replacement of jobs. But, I mean, we do need to think about solutions beyond that, right? Because when you look at the educational system, you know, we're not able to keep up with the higher, with the jobs that there are out there. 
the kinds of jobs that we have today. So I mean, I wanted to get your perspective on, as an academic, what you think that we should do to address that issue overall as a society. Um, and then my other question is also in regards to inequity. When we look at this cloud or this place from which these machine learning models are actually getting the data and working with it, who are we, are we really capturing everybody? Are we really going to be fair uh, when we look at things like mortgages or people uh, who've had plural issues and the um, actual models that they come up with, are they actually going to be able to like assess them fairly? So I wanted you to talk about these two issues. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think that, that both are very important. So you're absolutely right that, that this automation is, um, is causing further inequity. It's not affecting uniformly. Um, I actually think that many of the, low, the, the lower sort of manual labor is actually safer. Uh, that, that, that I don't think truck drivers are going to be replaced. I don't think taxi drivers or even Uber drivers are going to be replaced. I think we're... And that why? Because so many people talk about that. Is I know. And the thing is, I, I, it, it's, uh, it's, it's maddening to me because uh, I see Uber basically uh, insulting at some level its most important resource, which is its drivers, by claiming that they can replace them and they're about to do this in, in, in two years. I know the people working under Uber's self-driving car. They are the first to tell me it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's hard. It's very hard. And so Rod Brooks has a wonderful um, essay recently about this. And here's just one example. He said, you know, if you're driving your car, right, an autonomous car, driving around, and a lot of times, in a, in a, in not on the highway, I think we can do that. And in a busy traffic, yes, we can do it. But let's say in the suburban streets, all that, all those other places. A lot of times, you end up in a situation where somebody is stopped in the middle of the road. Now you have to decide, um, you have to use your horn, right? And I think it's sort of interesting because like, well, if, if you see that somebody is, a grandmother is getting, you know, coming out to the car, you hold back on the horn. <laughs> but, you know, if the, right, but if it's somebody just talking to their neighbor, you're like, eh, you know, but, you, but the horn, all the dynamics of, of how do you use that horn is incredibly complex. Like, but that's essential, you have to know how to operate a horn if you're gonna drive. We don't know how to do this. So that's why I think it's gonna, we're going to have uh, increasingly safety devices, and I think driving is going to become much safer than it ever was before because of these tools, and cameras will be monitoring when I slip out of the lane, et cetera. That's great. But to say that I'll be able to you know, completely get out of the car and, or, or sleep in the back, that's very far off. And the same is true for trucks. You know, we'll be able to put a, get on a truck on the freeway at night. The, the truck driver can sleep in the back. I think that's going to happen. But as soon as you get off the freeway, you're going to want that truck driver back in the driver's seat for a long, long, long time. So, um, so that's what I mean. That it, it may turn out that auto, these automation tools may end up in, uh, uh, causing more truck drivers to be hired as a result. Amazon, for example, is putting out uh, hiring, built, uh, uh, basically acquiring robots at a dramatic rate. For every robot they brought in last year, they hired six workers, six human workers. So there's something going on here that I think we need to, to think about. Inequality is a huge issue, absolutely. I don't know how exactly we're going to address that. And you're right that in these decisions, when we're collecting data, for the most part, we're collecting data from very privileged individuals who have access to the computing and time to be able to sit around and like, you know, type in stuff. So that's, that's, not, that's not everybody by any means. And so we have to be cognizant and thoughtful and, and empathetic for everyone else out there, uh, for the people who are, who are who are being who could be left behind or not being listened to, so absolutely, I completely think that's an issue. Could um, okay, there's this guy's been, yeah, you exactly, been, he's been having his hand out there. Hi, uh, Michael Perlmutter. I'm I'm an inventor and innovator. Thanks, great presentation. I you know on the boom and bust issue that Sunil was talking about. Uh, there's there's a, a phrase that I've been uttering for a really long time that we don't acknowledge, which is all, almost all growth is a step function with regression. But we, we broadcast to everyone that it's an exponential function, and when we don't tell everybody that growth is a step function with regression, we create these expectations that create these booms and busts. So I had kind of a really, really basic question because I was thinking about the grasping issue, and we really use end effectors that are op oppositional. So you were talking about uh, a, a thousand, right, a thousand faces, and, and that turned out to 14 trillion 
uh, um, um, permutations, but you didn't talk about they're really only opposing. So I, I can cut it for you in half right now and make it only seven trillion. But the real question that I had is, have you done any work on making just two-dimensional canonical forms out of the three-dimensional objects to limit the number of permutations and make this problem easier? And then the other question that I had, because you brought up the high school, is um, one of the effects of introducing high school in 1910 was we delayed the entrance into the workforce by all of those people who now were going to high school. So I'm going to propose that maybe we should, when we get close to the singularity, send all the robots to high school. <laughs> and we could delay their entrance to the workforce for another four years. <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, listen, I, I, I could totally geek out with you about lowering the dimensionality of the problem and trying to, to reduce the search space. And that, those are, that's exactly what we're working on. So I can, I can tell you more. But um, I think for tonight, well, let's talk, talk about that over a drink. The, the other part, you know, I think it's interesting to say about delaying the entry of the workforce. Maybe, maybe there's something good there. Maybe you're onto something because, uh, you know, I think if we, right now we have high school that goes up to 18, right? Maybe it should go longer. Maybe there should be, we should incorporate a uh, sort of a work, of, what do you call it, a year off, what do you do, a yeah. gap year? Yeah. yeah, I think this is really interesting because it's really going to learn new skills. Maybe it should even be more than a year. Maybe it should be two years. That, that, that students go out and then experience the world and see different things and basically acquire empathy and a lot of other skills. And now that should be probably really good for the long term of their careers. I also think it's related to, to ongoing, continuing education. And this is something also that I, I, when I see certain like, um, doctors have to go back to school every year for a certain number of times, engineers don't. It's weird, like why not? Our field is changing too, actually. And so we should incorporate that in almost every field. Teachers, plumbers, everybody should have to go back to school for a certain amount of time. If we just sort of incorporate that, then we have a whole new economy of, of the, the, those who are teaching it, and the, they're, they're taking these classes. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity in education. And I don't know the answers, but I think it's things that we can be thinking about and using these technologies as, a, as an opportunity, again, to, to think about, to rethink thinking. Okay, I feel like we've been neglecting over here, but let's give Ron here, who's been from the very a consistent person here. You connect the dots uh, here. Ron and Susan. Uh, so um, the high school that we went to actually was built in 1905, and my grandmother went there, my dad went there, I went there, and my nephews went there. Um, so my question a little bit is about education, to follow up a little bit. Uh, Susan was a teacher for 40 years, and we've noted that although the high school may have changed its curriculum, how teachers are trained to teach don't incorporate some of these new ideas. And I was just kind of curious whether or not you, in the uh, academy, people are beginning to think a little bit about education, but also how teachers are taught to teach children in high school and, and other places. I'd also like to co uh, compliment you on this idea of AI and IA. Um, this dates me, but I spent four years in a dormitory in college with Ray Kurzweil. So I knew about singularity before it was a big word, and I've always been uncomfortable with this idea of the singularity. In fact, Pete and I know this book that uh, Greg Pascal, uh, Ray Kurzweil, and Jaron Lanier, there was a, a book, I can't remember, where they debated it in this book. So I like the idea of multiplicity, but I really like the idea that we should flip from AI and add IA. But I was just curious as to whether or not either Berkeley or Stanford or others, people are beginning to think about how teachers are trained to incorporate some of these new, new uh, models, if you will. Okay, no, great. Um, I have to um, uh, put a disclaimer. So the IA is not my invention. That actually has been around since 1956. In fact, the same year that AI was coined. Um, uh, who did the mouse? What's his name? Uh, the Engelbart. 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 The Engelbart is, is credited with coming up with the IA part of it. So that's got a long history too. But I, and John John Markoff has a great book that came out last year about about the IA bringing that back, and that he calls all the design is really about intelligence amplification, and that that's been so successful. So, um, so, so, so I, I firmly believe that, but I don't want to take credit for it. And the other part of it is, in, in terms of teaching teachers, you're absolutely right, that's a brand new open field. We, we, we're still teaching teachers in the same way, and I think we, we need to change that. And at all levels, from, from, from preschool all the way up through college, professors need to be rethinking how they're, how they're being trained. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna keep you 
from the food trucks very long, but there's a few last questions, but here's someone from Singularity University, so let's, let's hear from that. Hi, Ken. So my name is Lisa K. Solomon. I work at Singularity University, and I guess the first thing I want to suggest, not quite a confrontation, but Singularity University is not about teaching you all when the singularity is happening. I just want to make that super clear. Uh, and Ray Kurzweil is one of the founders, and it is founded on some of that uh, uh, sort of very provocative idea about how humans and computers will work, and I thought you did a beautiful job. I'm very inspired by the idea of the multiplicity. Um, what we do do is expose executives and innovators and students to what these technologies are individually and how they might work together in convergent ways, and ultimately how they might liberate scarce resources like some of the human qualities we talked about to create impact on some of our most uh, impressing challenges. Um, so my question for you, Ken, um, is really getting back to something that you started and actually pulling back on the comment here earlier about you know, can, can we liberate fear and perhaps uh, create optimism and hope to be more abundant? And so I really think that the where we need to spend a lot of time is around the imagination piece that you talked about, that, that we don't, we, we, we lean into fear because that's more visible and that, you know, gets our amygdala, you know, how might we, you know, ignite imagination, also pick up on Ron's point, you know, from the very beginning, that, that we, we need to teach our children to be more imaginative and curious about these technologies themselves. Great. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. And, um, I, and I, I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to say, I am not, um, I don't want to be in any way critical of Singularity University. It's a, it's a wonderful program, and I, I know a number of the, 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 the professors there, the graduates, and it's extremely enviable, I mean, that, that you have a grant now that actually supports, gives students, a, a, covers all of their tuition. We would love that at Berkeley. Uh, so it is a great program, and it's, it is doing exactly this. I, I, I remember um, someone there once recently said, well, we're not, we don't really, we're not just about Singularity, and we're not a university. So, you know, yeah, no, but but I but I think that it's a, it is powerful as a meme that gets people thinking about the future. So that in that way, it's really good. So again, I apologize. I did not mean to to uh, slander the university. But the the, the other thing about um, creating um, enthusiasm and rather than fear, I do think that that this is where the artists may play an interesting role. Artists and writers and filmmakers, and um, because I think what they can do is start to imagine these futures that may be uh, constructed and in interesting new ways. And I think that that's because it's it, you know there's so many of these films and books uh, and shows that are that play the same meme over again. You know, it's the, the the robots get get run amok and then something bad happens. And I think that that story is just sort of time to it's time to shift. And I think that, you know, I could talk all day about this, but it would be great to illustrate it and really have these stories told. And so, you know, I think that that's, the opportunity is that, I, I do believe in it, I, I've seen this, um, with Tiffany, is that if you make a film that tells that story really compellingly, that's a way of getting people thinking in new ways. So I think that film is need, needs to be made, and I'm <laughs> trying to convince her to do it. All right, thank you, Lisa. Well, you have, you have a, a film. Oh, we do have a film. Yeah, can we do it? Let's see one last one. Okay. Huh? Why are we looking for it? One last question, and then we're going to show this film, and then we're going to get you guys. The film is super short, food, by the way. Drink, Five minutes. Everyone want to hang out and we keep talking. But that's uh, one last question. No, so thank you for the co uh, presentation. Uh, Scott Mauvais. Um, you talk a lot about sort of the downside being uh, replacement and jobs and sort of that scenario. And I guess um, I'm more worried on the assumption that AI is only used by good actors. And so you know, are there scenarios where um, AI augment, augments bad actors? So we had election cycle and bots, and we humans are easily fooled. And they don't ha it doesn't have to be perfect in a Turing test perfect, to cause lots of havoc. And are there scenarios, are there guardrails, are there things similar to what the bioethics community has done around places that we just won't go, that we need to set similar guardrails in the um, automation AI space? Great question. And yes, I mean, absolutely. The, the, there, it's, it's, it's probably easier to use, um, to use AI or computers to, to sort of uh, do denial of service attacks and all kinds of create all kinds of uh, disruptions and, um, and and so confusion. I mean, I, I'm actually expecting that we're going to see a lot more of this. And so I, I think there could be something along the lines of this: what the bioethics uh, groups have done with the atomic 
scientists have done, where you, you sort of map out sort of things that you really want to, you, you want to limit progress in certain areas. I know that that's very difficult, and I'm not sure it can be done, because as a, we can legislate this or recommend it all we want, but there's always going to be some incentive for someone in some part of the world to break that rule. But it, there, there, is rule, there is room for some kind of ethics here. And I don't know how, what form that should take. But I do think it's good that, that people are thinking about it. Do you want to show? I would love to. So if everyone will indulge us, uh, this is a, uh, just a five minute video. Tiffany and I made a few, uh, that is, is, it sort of summarizes these ideas and maybe just sort of leave you on with something fun before we, uh, before we break for more drinks. We're going to break for drink, we're going to break for food, and we're going to have a lot of just continuing the conversation. But Let's watch this just to send us up. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. on. So do you think robots are going to surpass humans and take over? No, we don't need to worry about robots surpassing us. That's why I love him. He doesn't believe robots are going to take over. Actually, the more I learn about robots, the more I realize how far we still have to go. How far back does the history of robots go? It goes back a long way. They say that the ancient Egyptians built moving statues. They were the ones who invented the steam engine. So they were the original steampunks. Yeah, right. Actually, there are countless stories in Eastern and Western culture. The Greeks imagined a statue that comes to life. There's the Golem of Prague. You remember Frankenstein, leading up to C-3PO and Astro Boy. But where are the real robots, like, in our world today? Well, they're mostly in factories. Actually, now there are over a million industrial robots working on assembly lines, doing things like welding and painting. So those robots are way too busy to be plotting to take over the world. And I have made that dream come true. Lord, you have the greatest creation of man's intelligence. A human robot. <laughs> but one thing we do have to worry about is robot drones. It turns out that robots are better at flying than driving. Why? Because there's a lot more empty space in the air than on the road, so there are more variables. The new drones are agile and essentially invisible, so they can observe and then strike without warning. Which is really friggin' scary. Absolutely. But there are also many applications where robots could be helpful. See, back in the 1950s, we all thought robots would replace humans. We wanted to work less and have more leisure time. But today we want jobs, so we're focusing on robots that can enhance how we work rather than replacing us. So robots that are more like companions than tools. Right. The emphasis now is on robots that can help us with things, like folding laundry, driving our cars, assisting surgeons in the operating rooms to be more precise, even helping people walk. There's all kinds of interesting research being done on robots that cooperate with humans. Well, what about everyday life? I mean, we could certainly use one in our house. What about the robot that I actually can clear our dinner table? Now that turns out to be a surprisingly hard problem. Now, put yourself in the position of being a robot. Everything is out of focus for you. What you see is jittery, confusing. It's very hard to coordinate your sensors and motors. So you're uncertain about your environment and your actions. Nothing is reliable, not even your own body. So when you reach out to pick something up... You feel very clumsy. Right. But there's an exciting new concept called belief space. That sounds so Californian. It does. But it's a mathematical framework that allows robots to analyze uncertainty and to learn over time so they can predict which actions are most likely to succeed. But belief space requires a huge amount of number crunching to extract the signal from the noise, which is why we're developing another concept that we call cloud robotics. The idea here is that each robot doesn't have to do all the thinking by itself. Instead, robots connect online over the internet to clusters of computers that do the number crunching. Like what humans are doing, sharing information over the web. Exactly. Robots are now getting on the internet to share data and software. So does that mean that soon robots are going to meet on Robot Grinder or Robot Facebook? Or Inner Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they'll start procrastinating by watching themselves on YouTube. But even with the cloud, robots are still very far from being as graceful as humans. I'm finally getting something that in our whole 17 years together, I don't think I've fully gotten as deeply as right now, which is that all of your art installations, 
They're really about the gap between what humans can do and what robots can't do. Yes! <laughs> yeah, yay! No, I that, got you! Because <laughs> that gap is profound. It reveals those things about us that are uniquely human. Like what? What are some of the things that robots can't do? Where do I start? I mean, they don't have intuition. They don't have emotion. They can't be creative. They can't fall in love. They can't fall in love. But that's why robots are endlessly fascinating, because they remind us how vulnerable we are and how amazing we are. I love that. Ooh. <laughs> no. <laughs> big, a big hand for